Hi, Dr. Dave here. In this video, I replay some amazing highlights, attempt to create some of the shots, and analyze shot options from the greatest pool match of all time between Mike Siegel and Nick Varner from the 1990 US Open Nine Ball Championship. The full Race to 11 match is available for free online via the link in the video description, courtesy of Pat Fleming and AccuStats. Mike and Nick are two of the greatest nine ball players of all time, and they really showcased their skills in this match. The match was also called by two of the greatest commentators of all time, Grady Matthews and Buddy Hall. Some of their commentary isn't politically correct by today's standards, but most of it is very entertaining. Here's an example of some of their dated discussion. I've enjoyed watching the ladies' matches. Certainly make the tournament arena a little easier to look at. <laughs> yes, they do. I mean, she, she's improved. She's a pretty good little player, little Texas girl. The ladies look nice, too, attired in their multicolored array. Grady and Buddy also pointed out several times why one of Siegel's nicknames is Mike the Mouth. Now Mike Siegel has already picked out the designated yes man, and he gestured to said person. <laughs> Mike always likes to chirp anyway. Oh, yeah, he he's does a chirper. A good nature thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's a chirper. He definitely likes to tell why he done this and why he done that. Now let's get to the action. Spoiler alert, I will be showing highlights from the entire match, so if you haven't seen it yet, visit the link in the video description first. In addition to exhibiting great run-out skills, both Mike and Nick broke exceptionally well. Couple of effort. They made the wing ball on every single break, and often got a good look at the one to allow for many break and runs. Both players also demonstrated good ball pocketing and cue ball control skills. Here's a good example from Nick. Oh, what a nice shot. How's he hitting them? He later followed that up with a two-way carom shot. Nice smooth stroke, stay down oh, on the ball. He had a shot at the nine. A little extra reward as Nick Varner takes the lead two games to one. Here's a rare miss by Mike. But even then, he got lucky and hooked Nick. Hence one of his other nicknames, Mike Captain Hook Siegel. Captain Hook showed up. Mike won seven straight racks, and the only other time he let Nick to the table was after this well-executed safety. Put yourself in Nick Varner's situation. This is what you got to look at, trailing eight to two. Nick gets a good hit. But Mike banks it in, putting Nick back in his chair again. And a nice shot. Being down 9-2, with Mike breaking and needing only two more games, Nick must have thought his prospects were hopeless at this point. But then Mike makes his first big mistake, scratching on the break. They were playing under old rules, where balls spotted after a scratch in the break, with the opponent getting ball in hand in the kitchen. Nick plays a great safety. That's one way of doing it. But Mike gets a good hit. Nick had a shot, but no reasonable way to get a follow-on shot at the two. Well, and as I say that, I, I really don't think that shot was well conceived. Here's where the real magic started. Nick manages to kick bank the two into the side. I don't think Nick was expecting to pocket this ball. He was probably just trying to separate the cue ball and two on opposite sides of the table. To try to get a feel for how tough that shot was, I decided to recreate it. I first aimed the shot carefully by visualizing the hit I needed on the two, splitting the distance between the cue ball and ghost ball target, and making an adjustment down table since shallow angle kicks like this go long. I almost pocketed the ball on the first attempt. Later, I would realize how lucky this was. This shot is a lot more difficult than it might look. If you aim just a hair above the rail target, or use slightly too much speed, the cue ball will hit the object ball too full. And if you aim just a hair below the rail target, or use slightly too little speed, the cue ball will hit the object ball too thin. It took me 39 attempts to eventually pocket the ball. And using what I felt was the same aim and the same speed as most of the previous shots, it finally went. This shot was a lot tougher than I thought it would be, especially after getting so close on my first attempt. Nick was extremely lucky to pocket this ball. Here, Nick was trying to hit the three thin enough to allow the cue ball to squeeze by the five and seven, but he managed to corner hook himself from the four. 
Miraculously, he made this shot too. He's kicked two balls in this rack. <laughs> I decided to recreate this shot also. First, I aimed carefully by visualizing the required line into the four, passing through the line of diamonds a little less than a diamond beyond the table. Splitting the difference would require a rolling hit to the point of the side pocket, so I need to aim above the point and add running spin to make it work. Here's my first attempt. I need a little more spin or less speed to pocket the ball. That was too much spin. Unlike the previous shot, this one is fairly easy to dial in, making small changes in spin, keeping the aim and speed the same. I pocketed the ball on the 11th attempt. Making the previous shot 1 out of 39 attempts, and this shot 1 out of 11, would suggest that my odds for making both shots back to back, like Nick did, would be less than 1 in 400. Nick was obviously much better than me, but that was still an amazing, one of a kind shot sequence for Nick to pull off in a stressful match situation like that. He still needed to make a few more good shots to finish the rack, and he did. Nick runs these last three balls. That may be the single greatest run out that I've ever espied. Doesn't get any better than that. He is down 9-3, but at least he has Mike in his seat for a change. In the next game, Nick needed to bank the three. Never a doubt, was there? Oh, he hit it nice. He hit it nice. Two games later, he decided to bank the one, despite Buddy's prediction. He ain't gonna bank that ball. <laughs> if he can hit that ball full and stick his ball, believe me, it's coming three rails out of there. Trust me. He bumped into the seven by accident on the five ball shot. Uh oh, he didn't mean he to hit right, it. Come right even on top of it. And he didn't compensate enough for cut and deuce throw with the stun shot on the seven, resulting in his only real error in the match so far. Mike was happy to get out of his seat to clear the table. With Mike breaking again after playing so well before and only needing one game to win, it again seems like Nick will surely lose this match. But Mike makes another huge error by scratching on the break again, giving Nick another chance. After a safety from Nick, Mike unluckily kisses off the three and scratches again. Nick breaks out the 3-9 cluster and gets the early win to pull within three games of the match. In the next game, Nick faces a tough shot on the one and misses it. It probably didn't help that he uncharacteristically lifted his head and body during the shot. Now Mike just needs to clear the table to win the match. Nick must surely now think his chances are hopeless. Mike is a little unfortunate to lead the three balls straight in. The shot is tough to reach because he is left-handed, so he decides to shoot it right-handed instead, needing to draw straight back for the four at the bottom of the table. He doesn't hit the cue ball quite low enough and comes up well short. Nick has life in the match yet again. Mike's shot was not very difficult for any decent player shooting with their dominant hand. I was able to get a good result on the first attempt. And even if I had used much less speed, the out would have still been easy. I'm sure Mike was confident to draw back enough with his right hand, but it didn't work out. Mike's real error was leaving himself straight on the three after the two ball shot. If he had left an angle on the three like this, he could have shot the three with his left hand and easily got in shape on the four. He could have also come up much shorter and easily send the cue ball off two rails to the four. He could have also just easily held the cue ball for short side shape on the three to follow down table. He could have also played for the three in the other corner, again making the out easy. Again, Mike's fatal mistake was leaving the three straight where he had to shoot it right-handed. Although, he still should have gotten out for the match win. Easy for me to say. Returning to the game, Mike almost kicks the four in, but he leaves Nick with a shot. 
and Nick makes a few nice shots to win the game. Now Nick is breaking again, needing three straight games to win the match. He starts out great, again pocketing the wing ball and getting shape on the one. Well, Nick's going to have a perfect shot on the one. And he easily clears the table. In the next game, Nick misses the one, but used outside spin to play a nice two-way shot to leave Mike hooked. Mike got a good hit and left Nick tough. Nick again missed the one, but he again played smart position to leave Mike hooked again. Mike kicks in the one, but hooks himself on the two. Mike decides to jump over the obstacle with his playing cue. Jump cues weren't around much back then. If he hits the two thin enough, he has a good chance to pocket the nine for the match victory. I'm sure Nick was sweating this shot. Mike unfortunately double kissed the two and scratched in the upper corner. And Nick easily clears the table. Now the match is tied up at 10 for a Hill Hill case game with Nick breaking. For a change, Mike must think the situation is hopeless for him. Luckily for Mike, Nick again faces a tough shot on the one. Nick plays a decent safety, but Mike can see the edge of the ball. If Mike hits the one thin enough, he can again win the match with a carom on the nine. Again, Nick must have been sweating this shot. Mike missed and left Nick a carom shot, which he followed up with an aggressive bank and a thin back cut into the side. He comes up a little short on the four ball shot, but he plays very nice two rail shape to the five using the mechanical bridge. That was a great shot. Mike definitely must have thought it was over at this point. Nick leaves the nine almost straight in the side. A shot he should easily make 100 out of 100 times, but he carelessly hits it with stun and throws the nine into the point of the pocket. Regardless of why he missed the shot, this is a match winner he definitely had no excuse to miss. This is the type of shot you remember for the rest of your life, especially if it causes you to lose the match. Oh man! Uh, buddy, I have never seen the likes of it in my professional I have life. Never, ever, 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 ever seen anything like that in my life. Miraculously, the cue ball freezes up against the nine, leaving Mike in a tough spot. Shockingly, Mike doesn't give the shot much thought, like he had already given up on the match, and he recklessly fires at it with an elevated cue and fouls. Oh. He then concedes the match, putting an end to a heartbreaking journey. I could not be more surprised. I decided to recreate Mike's final shot to try to see if he had better options. Here's the layout. The line through the balls heads well to the left of the pocket. With a straight hit, the nine misses the pocket by a large margin. However, with slow speed close to a half ball hit, it is possible to throw the frozen ball into the left side of the pocket. That would have been a risky do or die shot, but it was a much better option than what Mike chose. This is what Mike was probably trying to do. That would have given him the victory, but this is a very low percentage shot. If the tip hits the cue ball a hair too high, or if the speed is a touch too fast, the bank goes way long. And if the tip hits a hair too low, or if the speed is a touch too slow, the bank comes up well short. Again, Mike's choice was desperate and reckless. Here are some more alternatives he could have chosen instead. He could have thinned the ball with draw to create distance and leave a really tough shot. He could have also hit the nine fuller and create distance like this. He could have also hit the nine full and left a tough cross corner or cross side bank like this. But none of these shots is ideal or easy. Nick was very fortunate to leave the balls frozen at an off angle like he did. But Nick deserved a little luck after making so many great shots and coming back from such a large deficit. I want to thank both Nick Varner and Mike Siegel for giving us such an amazing match to enjoy even more than 30 years after the fact. Again, if you want to watch the entire uncut match video, the link is available in the video description. Good luck with your game from Dr. Dave. Well, that's uh, probably the greatest comeback I ever made. I can't, I can't express how well you played that match. It's it just a great match. I felt match. good. I, I never felt pressure any time during the match. I still can't get over missing the nine. I mean, <laughs> I mean uh, it just looked like duck soap after the shots I had to make at rack. I mean, oh, the bank sure, and the sure. cut in the side, then uh, come across for the three, and then charting it up to come in short of the five. 
Well, Nick Varner, that's the most unbelievable match I've ever witnessed in my whole entire life. Thank you. 